Good evening. I'm Suzanne Keene, the president of Scripps College. It's wonderful to have such an amazing audience here tonight in person. And I welcome you all to what is sure to be another thought-provoking Scripps Presents event. Tonight's program has been made possible by the Scripps Presents public programming series, which brings the most timely, relevant, and dynamic writers, artists, and scholars into conversation with our community. In my first months as the 10th president of Scripps College, I have attended several events in this series. I've really enjoyed this season's programs from captivating literary conversations such as this one to powerful dance and musical performances. I also admire the way in which Scripps Presents brings our greater Claremont community together. I'm eager to see what the spring season has in store and I encourage you all to attend our upcoming events. It's now my pleasure to introduce world-renowned author Viet Thanh Nguyen and Scripps College's very own Wendy Cheng. <laughs> Viet Thanh Nguyen is the Errol Arnold Chair of English, Professor of English, American Studies and Ethnicity, and Comparative Literature at the University of Southern California. He is the editor of the Displaced, Refugee Writers on Refugee Lives, and the Library of America volume for Maxine Hong Kingston, and he has co-authored Chicken of the Sea, a children's book with his six-year-old son, six-year-old at the time of the writing, I believe, Ellison. His most recent novel, The Committed, continues the story begun in The Sympathizer, which is a New York Times bestseller and Pulitzer Prize winner for fiction. He's also the author of the best-selling short story collection, The Refugees, and most recently has been the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim and MacArthur Foundations. Other honors include the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, the Edgar Award for Best First Novel from the Mystery Writers of America, the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction from the American Library Association, the First Novel Prize from the Center for Fiction, a gold medal in first fiction from the California Book Awards, and the Asian Pacific American Literature Award from the Asian Pacific American Librarian Association. In short, we will soon have a star on our stage. And we are very proud that we will be joined by one of our own stars, Wendy Cheng, Assistant Professor of, Associate Professor of American Studies and Co-Chair of American Studies at Scripps College. Wendy's research has focused on race and ethnicity, comparative racialization, critical geography, urban and suburban studies, and political activism of Taiwanese student migrants to the US. Her book, The Changes Next Door to the Diaz's, Remapping Race in Suburban California, develops a theory of regional racial formation through the experiences and perspectives of residents of majority non-white multiracial suburbs. It won the 2014 Book Award from the American Sociological Association section on Asia and Asian American. Her co-authored book, A People's Guide to Los Angeles, for which she was also the photographer, provides a guide to sites of alternative histories and struggles over power in Los Angeles County. Before I welcome these two to the stage, I wanna give you a few important housekeeping notes. First, please make sure that your cell phones are silenced. We also ask that you refrain from flash photography or recording this event. Following tonight's program, we'll take questions from the audience. Please make sure that you share your question in the form of a question and keep it succinct. We wanna to get to as many of you as possible and that will help. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Viet Thanh Nguyen and Wendy Chang to the stage. Good evening. Such a pleasure to be here with Wendy. We've known each other for a very long time. It's so great to be here with you, Viet. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to know Viet as one of my mentors in graduate school many, many years ago, and he has had a lifelong influence on who I am as a scholar and a writer. Um, tonight, Viet has generously agreed to talk with us about and share some personal photos from some of the places and the eras that have shaped him as a writer and a person. 
Um, before we do that, though, I'd love for Viet to share about what he's working on these days. So I know that there are at least two exciting developments. First, that you recently finished another book, which you've described as a work of both memoir and criticism, and that the main casting for the Sympathizer HBO TV series has just been completed. Could you tell us more? Yes, I know you all applauded for the TV series, but not for the memoir, got it. <laughs> Could you tell us more about each of these, as well as any other projects you're especially excited about these days? All right, let's get the boring stuff out of the way first. The memoir, uh, I'll read a little, about it, a bit, little bit from it tonight. Honestly, the most terrifying book I've ever written. Um, I don't know how many of you have thought about writing diaries or memoirs or anything like that. It's something I never wanted to do. And it came about because my agent, uh, my editor said, oh, you've written all these essays. You know, why don't you just put them together and make a nonfiction book? I said, you're gonna pay me for this? He said, yes. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do this. And then of course, once I started doing it, I realized I can't just like slap together a bunch of essays. I need to tell a story. And that story was about my family and me. And you'll get a glimpse of that. Um, and then the TV series, yes. Uh, for those of you who haven't read The Sympathizer yet, shame on you. Uh, now there's a TV series. And what that means is you never have to read The Sympathizer. You can just watch it on TV. Um, and so it was a, it's, it's obviously awesome in a lot of ways. Uh, on Saturday, for example, I had lunch with Robert Downey Jr. and Sandra Oh. I just wanted to be able to say that, you know, and then, and then for those of you who know something about Korean cinema, Park Chan-wook, our director, was right across the table from us. If you haven't seen his most recent movie, Decision to Leave, which is out in the theaters now, you should really go see it. He won Best Director at Cannes for this sort of uh, Hitchcockian murder drama set in, set in Korea. He's amazing. And his film, uh, Old Boy, was a major influence on The Sympathizer. And then there were all these young Vietnamese American and Vietnamese Australian actors who've been cast for the TV series. And so there's so much excitement about this, uh, and I feel it too. And um, it, it, I mean, part of, you know, you know this as a scholar, you can write a really good book, like a really good novel, and you'd be lucky if you sold tens of thousands of copies but you can make a really bad TV series or movie and millions of people will watch it. So there's, there's a lot of power to TV, cinema, Hollywood that, that you know, we're gonna try to exploit, but there's a lot of pressure as a result of that too. So just a quick follow up to that. Um, what is it like working with Hollywood after having critiqued Hollywood's depiction of the Vietnam War and Vietnamese people uh, for so many years? Well, if the TV series sucks, it's their fault. If it's great, it's my, my, my creation. So I don't know, I mean, I, like, it, uh, when I, uh, my, all of my interaction with Hollywood has been that people are very smart, you know. Maybe they're very dumb people, but they've kept them away from me. Um, so people are very smart. They're, they're, very, they're very business savvy, they're market savvy, and they're art savvy as well. And the complication is that when you're a writer, whether you're a poet or a memoirist or novelist, it's all pretty much you. Um, and this is why you know, fiction and poetry can respond very quickly to the social and political crises of our time because all it really takes is a writer's time and their life, which doesn't count for anything. But when you're doing TV or cinema, it's millions of dollars are being invested. So even though there are all these very smart people involved, they're, 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 they're concerned not just about the art, but they're concerned about the market as well. And that's something that I'm not really used to thinking about. But it's also a collaborative effort, and that's also something I'm not used to dealing with as well. I become a writer because I don't like people. And then when you're in, in Hollywood, you have to at least have some liking for people because you spend all this time with them. So the collaborative process is interesting because I'm reading all the scripts. I'm not involved in writing the scripts, so there's all these other people writing the scripts, and they're making changes to my novel. And I have to take a step back and think, well, uh, these are smart people. They're going to do this for a particular reason. I have to trust them. Uh, a lot of them are Asian Americans who are involved in the writing of the TV series. And so that's a whole new dimension of, of being able to hopefully trust in people who have similar aesthetic and political and cultural sensibilities. Great. Thank you for sharing more about that. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the first vote, uh, photo that Viet has generously shared with us. So can you tell us about this photo of yet and why you picked it? Well, the little boy is me. I believe I'm somewhere between two and three years old, and I'm holding my mother's hand. Uh, she's younger than I am now. I think she would be in her, uh, she would be about 
mid-30s, early to mid-30s at this point. And we are in a rubber plantation uh, near my hometown of Ban Me Thuot in central uh, highlands, Vietnam. This photograph is very meaningful for me because I actually only got it about five or seven years ago. I didn't have this when I was growing up, but you know, we became refugees in 1975 and Ban Me Thuot was actually the first town captured in the final invasion of uh, South Vietnam. And uh, my mom uh, fled with my brother and me. My brother is seven years older. My dad was already in Saigon, so we were cut off and my mom had to make this life and death decision. And my mom, in making this decision, decided to leave behind my adopted sister, who was 16 years old. She's still there now. So five or seven years ago, she sent us this picture, which I had never seen. So for me, it was just a, a glimpse of my life that obviously was very meaningful for me, but of which I have no memory. And so much of my own career, um, my career as a writer and a scholar, has been about history and memory. What we remember, what we don't remember, how we're shaped by the things we don't remember. And I have a son, I have two children now, uh, and I think that I'm spending all this time with them, having very meaningful experiences and memories for me, and a lot of that they will have no memory of at all. Which, in some ways, is very emotionally manageable if you think you're gonna spend the rest of your life with your children. But then, in, in these kinds of circumstances, you know, you've been separated, as I was from my adopted sister, for example. Um, also, you know, when I came to the United States at the age of four, I was fluent in Vietnamese, and all these decades later, I'm still fluent in Vietnamese, at a four-year-old level. So it makes it kind of hard to have emotionally meaningful conversations with my parents, right? Whereas with my own children, you know, we can have these kinds of conversations. So photos like this really, you know, very poignant for me as, you know, they're always personal for everybody, but very poignant because they also mark a, lo uh, a whole other, you know, parallel life and alternate universe that I could have had if there wasn't a war. Thank you. Um, so related to that, um, you mentioned in an earlier conversation that the book you just finished is very much about your mother and that the writer Gina Apostol described it as an attempt to theorize the other through the mother. So as someone who's also written a lot about my mother, who is somewhere here on, in the audience tonight, <laughs> um, this was so intriguing to me. Um, what does that mean? I mean, do you agree with that characterization? What does it mean? Well, Gina Apostle, she's very, very smart, and she's a terrific novelist. I uh, really recommend uh, her work to you. Start with Insurrecto, her novel about um, the Philippine Revolution uh, and movies. But uh, Gina has it right, you know? Gina has it right. Um, she read the memoir, and the non, this memoir nonfiction, and a lot of it is about my mother, and because my mother passed away in 2018, and my mother, uh, for the last 13 years of her life, was, in, was ill, you know, with, the, with a number of um, uh, mental health issues. And uh, I, I was really looking forward to this time with my mother, because right before she fell ill, she and my father retired, and they came and visited uh, my wife and me in, in Paris. And it was a great, great trip. You know, I finally got to spend time with my parents as an adult. They trusted me. I took them on a tour of the Catholic shrines of Europe. That was their idea of a good time, but I did it. You know, so everything was wonderful. And then she fell ill. And then that, all that possibility vanished. And I saw, uh, you know, my father, who should have been retired and happy in his 70s and 80s, taking care of my mother. So it was really you know, an emotionally difficult time for, for my family. Um, and it made me reflect a lot about uh, who my mother was, everything she had been through. You know, she was born poor in this rural northern village, and she basically, you know, with very little education, became a self-made businesswoman and became wealthy in Vietnam, lost everything coming to the United States as a refugee, built herself back up again with a second fortune. Can you imagine? That's a really epic life. And as I was writing her obituary, I thought, I mean, obviously it's very meaningful to me, and I have to write about that, but there are so many people like my mother. And so I wanted to write a memoir that was about my mother, but was also about all of the historical and political conditions that created people like my mother. And I wanted to write a memoir that was not just like an individualistic memoir, which is I think what we're encouraged to write in the United States, especially as immigrants or as refugees. Tell us some heart, heartwarming story about your parents and their suffering and all that. And the, the book is partly about that, but the book is also partly about how people like my mother are not unique because of the terrible historical conditions that created so many people like her. And so when Gina says, I theorized the other through my mother, it's twofold. I'm talking about otherness in general, the historical political conditions of being Asian as other, for example. But I also talk about the fact that as a writer, 
you know, we, 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 we have to be empathetic. We have to engage with others. But it's not only in this theoretical sense of like, let's talk about the racial other or the, the whatever. Sometimes the, there's a line in the memoir, the other is someone who's too close to us. Sometimes the other is the person literally right next to you that you spent your entire life with, your father, your mother, your siblings, whatever. It can be really hard to empathize with these people who you've spent your entire life with. And so the book is partly about that too, like that, that difficulty, that, intimate, that difficulty of intimacy and the complications of, uh, of a four-letter word called love. You know, like I grew up never hearing my parents say I love you and I never said I loved you to my parents either. And yet, obviously, our, our family life was all about love. Everything my parents did, they, what they sacrificed themselves for, was for the love of their children and their, and their grandchildren. And, um, you know, it's painful, uh, I think, for so many of us to think that, uh, that, that, that that love is true, and yet many of us are not able to express that. And so I, I, I was able to express that to my parents. And so with my dad, for example, you know, uh, we, my brother and I have worn him down over the last 10 or 15 years. Now he says, I love you all the time. We feel that's a real accomplishment, and we say it to him. And he says it to, he says it to us in Vietnamese, and he says it to his grandkids in English. And so there's some hope, there's some hope there. But at the same time, there's also decades and decades and decades of struggle and, and sadness uh, there as well. So that's what the memoir is about. Great. So now we'll move to um, one of the key locations of that sadness and <laughs> uh, intergenerational struggle. Um, San Jose, <laughs> can we have the next slide, please? <laughs> so the little boy grew up to be this obnoxious 16-year-old that you see here. Uh, and this is where, this is our house. I'm going to talk about this house, uh, not the house in the back, but this is the driveway of the house on South 10th Street where I, where I spent my formative decade um, from 1978 to 1986 where a lot of, you know, uh, I was really most sort of emotionally scarred by the refugee experience here. Um, and we live right next to the freeway, which you can see in the back. And this is my brother's first car, I believe a Buick Skylark. It would become my first car in a couple of years. And so, you know, the memoir is also partly about the fact that, and I think I share the sentiment with a lot of people, a lot of writers, childhood really is what we write about. I mean, it transmutes itself in so many different ways, but the emotions of childhood and adolescence and the struggles of identity and agony that we go through, they really mark us, or they mark me. And so, for example, The Sympathizer, it's not an autobiography by any means. The Sympathizer is about a spy, a liar, a traitor, a womanizer, an alcoholic, a murderer, ultimately. So you better hope it's not autobiographical. But the emotional core of the sympathizer is autobiographical because the opening line of the sympathizer is, I'm a, man, I'm a spy, a sleeper, a spook, a man of two faces. And when I was growing up, I felt like uh, my parents were always telling me, you're 100% Vietnamese. But in my parents' 100% Vietnamese household, I felt like I was an American spying on these strange people. And then when I stepped out of the household into the, the, the rest of the American world, I felt like a Vietnamese spying on Americans. That, that was part of the emotional core of what it meant to grow up in San Jose, California, in this house. And so I just took that core and I put it into the spy. And obviously, this 16-year-old kid, he wants to be someone hip and cool like James Bond. Failed miserably, of course. But this was also part of the aspiration. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I'd love to hear you talk about um, more the ways that San Jose shaped you as a person and a writer. And one thing that I noticed is that you talked about how um, constantly being told by community members, particularly in church um, and in language school, that um, the various ways that you were not Vietnamese enough um, uh, created, you called it a distaste for authenticity, which I think kind of runs through all of your work, right? That impulse to challenge the, the status quo um, and the heart of things. Um, and then you also said, uh, talked about how glad you were to leave. Um, so I guess a couple of things. Um, one is what are some of the perhaps not obvious ways San Jose shaped you as a person and as a writer? And then have you made your peace with San Jose? Well, you know, uh, my parents said I was 100% Vietnamese, but then every other Vietnamese person thought I was a banana. And I like to think of myself as 10 or 20 years ahead of my time, because if you go to San Jose now, all the young Vietnamese Americans are just like I was back then. They can't speak Vietnamese. You know, they just want to you know, participate in English language culture and all that kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I was constantly told that I wasn't authentically Vietnamese. And yet, every time I saw authentic Vietnamese culture, number one, it is heartwarming. Vietnamese food is good. Vietnamese food people are very hospitable. 
But uh, there's a line in the memoir where I say, you know, um, uh, Vietnamese people are very good at stabbing each other in the back because that's the back that's closest to them. That to me is partly what authenticity in home is about. Authenticity in home is about everybody knowing who you are and welcoming you in and everybody knowing exactly where your underbelly is so they can really hurt you. And so I was always very suspicious of that authenticity and wholeness because I always felt that there was danger and violence, emotional violence, but sometimes literal violence lurking there. So the memoir, uh, the memoir also talks about the time you know, we were invaded in our house at gunpoint uh, and, you know, the Vietnamese people were very afraid, of home, very afraid of home invasion by other Vietnamese people because other Vietnamese people knew exactly where to go to get the money and the gold and all that, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that stuff is, has really marked me as, uh, as, an, as, an, as, a, as a person. And uh, I, I, felt it, I found it very hard to return to San Jose. You know, my parents opened the, perhaps the second Vietnamese grocery store in San Jose. I'll talk about that. And if you go to San Jose now, that grocery store is no longer there. You know what's there? The most expensive apartment building in San Jose. And across the street is San Jose's new city hall. So when we were there, it was a rough and struggling neighborhood. And then my parents were part of this generation who, of Vietnamese refugees who turned San Jose's downtown around and then got erased from the landscape. So that, that made me very angry. And so I didn't want to come back to San Jose for all the emotional complications, but also for this thing that I felt the city had done uh, to us. So after about 20 or 30 years, I was finally able to sort of go back to San Jose, you know. Um, uh, but still, I still, I still, I feel like I accept San Jose, but I still don't like San Jose. Sorry to anybody who's from <laughs> San Jose. Thank you. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? Okay. Was going to Berkeley an act of rebellion? I loved going to Berkeley. I'm, I'm about 19 or 20 years old here, so some, the same age as, as some of the students out here. And uh, when I stepped foot on the Berkeley campus, I felt like I came home. At last, I was at the University of Communists at Berkeley. It was great. You know, I felt like I reached my political and intellectual home wherever I wanted to, where, where I wanted to be compared to what I felt to be provincial San Jose. Not fair to San Jose, but that's how I felt about it. And you know, the, I literally the semester I arrived uh, at Berkeley, I took Asian American studies, was instantly converted, also instantly pissed off. I was like, oh my God, how come I didn't know about all this Asian American history and all the terrible things that were done to Asian Americans? And I also joined the Asian American Political Alliance, and here it is, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to a protest, not just with Asian Americans, but what we call the United Front, so a whole uh, coalition of students of color and sympathetic white students and our, our, po our political agenda at the time was faculty diversity and faculty curricula and things like this, which in some ways might seem trivial because we came in the wake of the anti-apartheid protests of the 1980s. And so to me in the 1990s, it felt like talking about curriculum and, and tenure and, and diversity seems like sort of weak. But then you think about the fact that in the 80s and 90s, this was considered the culture wars. Like these kinds of issues were supposed to tear the country apart. And now, 30 or 40 years later, when we talk about the, the, the stuff about critical race theory and book banning and book burning, it's exactly the same kind of issue. So I think we, we had our finger on something that, that these intellectual issues were actually really important to us as students, but also um, to the country as a whole. Anyway, I got, I got really into it, so I was arrested twice. Oh yeah, okay, cool, yeah, 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 yeah. still on my record, yes. As I know, when I talk to the Transportation Security Administration, they pull up my record and they're like, oh, you were arrested twice, okay. Uh, the, the interesting thing about that is I actually had to go to court for this. I had like four counts against me of resisting arrest and trespassing. And Professor Ling Chi Wang, my professor at Berkeley, well, he was connected, so he got me a lawyer, a pro bono lawyer, Garrick Liu, who with his partner, Dale Minami, had a few years earlier won Japanese redress and reparations. So they were really significant civil rights law firm and he was a really interesting civil rights lawyer who drove a Porsche. Well, that is the best of both worlds. And uh, yeah, so he got, he got me uh, community service. And, uh, but I bear, that, I, bear that, I bear those four convictions with, with pride. Excellent, great. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you a little bit more about how kind of coming into your Asian American identity as a political identity um, maybe affected or shaped how you then thought about Vietnamese identity moving forward? So, you know, the Vietnamese refugee community uh, then and, and very much now were deeply shaped by anti-communism because most of the people had fled from uh, communism and really, really hated it. 
And so the community was very conservative, and I also grew up as a Catholic. So Vietnamese Catholics are very, con you know, Catholics are conservative, anti-communists are conservative, so Vietnamese anti-communist Catholics are really conservative. And so I, I grew up with that as my, my upbringing. And then you go to Berkeley, and it's obviously much, much more radical. Um, and I became an Asian American, and the, the roots of Asian American politics are in Marxism and anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism. So there's a conflict there between being an Asian American and being a Vietnamese refugee. And that was actually really productive for me because I think a lot of people who became Asian American studies academics have this idea that being an Asian American is always about being radical. And it could be, but my experience with Vietnamese refugees is that we can be really conservative too. And so I felt there was that tension. It was actually really helpful for me as an intellectual and an academic to think about what that meant for Asian American politics. And here you are, you are is this Orange County? This is, no. no. Oh, okay, oh, congratulations. We're still in LA well, We're County. close to Orange County close to Orange County, and you see some of the real politics being played out with like Asian American conservative politicians and communities being a real thing. And so for, for the Asian Americans of my generation, the intellectual and political reaction to that was to dismiss them as being not real Asian Americans. I mean, that was really the language that was being used. And my attitude was, well, no, they really are Asian Americans. They're just not the politically acceptable ones. How do we theorize this? How do we study this? And so that, I devoted quite a bit of time to thinking about that. Great. And that was your first book, right? You don't have to read that. Very influential book for me and for the field. I highly recommend Bless you. My high school best friend said, I have a copy on my bedstand, nightstand, so I can go to sleep. That's what he used. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so we will move to the next photo. Because I sense that we may be starting to... Oh, there's the clock. Okay. Um, okay, so... Um, tell us about this photo. So in 2004, I go back to Vietnam for the second time. 2002 was the first time I went for a couple of weeks as a tourist just to get used to the country because I knew a serious visit would be very emotionally complicated since most of my family was still in Vietnam. 2004, I returned to Vietnam uh, for the second time for seven months to study Vietnamese formally at the Vietnam National University. If by studying you mean going to bars and nightclubs and drinking a lot, that's what I did. And so then I was ready to go visit my, uh, my, my, my home, my, 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 what did you call it, um, the origins. This is where my uh, parents were born, in this very small northern village, central northern village. And this is the compound that my paternal grandfather had built and my father was raised in. So my paternal grandfather raised, three, raised four boys and a daughter in this compound. And when I came back, uh, three of those sons were still living here with all of their children and grandchildren. So you can imagine it was very crowded. I thought I was gonna be all ready for this after having studied Vietnamese for several months. No one had told me, beginning with my parents, that in this village, they speak a really weird brand of Vietnamese. Um, and so all my formal academic Vietnamese was nearly useless here because even the word for water was actually different. And all the terminology for your, your relatives was different. And so I showed up and I was completely surrounded, uh, like I said, you know, with very hospitable Vietnamese people. This is home. Um, too bad, again, I don't like people. So this was a real shock for me to be surrounded by all these uh, Vietnamese relatives of mine who I'd never met before. Um, and so I got to see how my parents lived. And I, got to, I think I got to understand why my parents never wanted to go back. Like me fleeing from San Jose, I think the equivalent was them leaving this rural, little rural northern village and then, you know, after 40 years, you're inevitably changed by having been in, a, in the United States for so long, living in the suburbs, and then you come back, and you know, my, my Vietnamese language teacher said, oh my God, they have running water and electricity. That's amazing. Like, in most of this area, there was no running water and electricity. So that was the kind of place where my parents grew up. So it was really important for me to see it, um, to see where they were coming from and what they were running from. Thank you. Um Okay, so we will now go to our very last photo. Okay. Um, this is obviously you with your son, Ellison, uh, with whom you co-wrote Chicken of the Sea. Um, and you've written beautifully about being both 
a son and a parent, and I think that goes back to what you were talking about, about the, the effort to understand the other as a kind of constant and ongoing um, process. And I just want to read a little bit of your New York Times essay um, from 2020, right after your second child, Simone, was born. You wrote, I was terrified of becoming a father because I did not know whether I could find the time or the love to spare. All my extra time went to my writing, which was my act of creativity. I expected that a child would be an enormous consumer of both time and love. What I did not expect was that a child, my son, would do more than demand. He would teach me unintentionally by his existence how to love and how to give of my time, the one thing I did not want to share. I not only played a role in creating a child, I also discovered that fatherhood recre recreated me by forcing me to recognize that the creation of a child did not stop at birth. Every moment with my son is a part of this act of creation and of creativity. I just thought that was such a beautiful reflection on parenting and creativity. Um, so what are Ellison and Simone teaching you these days? Well, yeah, no, I can't believe I wrote that actually. It's true, but you know, I, I never uh, thought I would write something like that. You know, what they teach me um, is, is actually about uh, not just the innocence of childhood, but also the creativity of childhood. I mean, this is one of the things they've taught me. You know, so, for example, I wrote my first book and drew my first book when I was eight years old. It was called Lester the Cat. Um, and, you know, and it was about a cat who uh, is an urban cat, and he's stricken with ennui. And he runs off to the countryside where he finds love with a country cat, the end, you know. Um, and then I lost all of that. I lost the capacity as I grew older to do things like imagine cats as characters. Instead, I became, you know, a professor, a PhD, serious novelist, all this kind of thing. And that, that involves creativity, too. But the older I got, the more rules I learned, the more conventions I learned, the more I learned how to behave and carry myself in a certain way, the more I learned about what the canon is and what great literature is supposed to be. And all that is important to know, right? Along comes Ellison. And at five years of age, you know, he's been steeped in children's literature and Marvel comic books. And he writes a book and draws a book called Chicken of the Sea. It's about bored chickens who run off from the farm to become pirates. I think that's a great story. I could never have come up with that. And so what childhood teaches me when I look at them is there are no rules. There are no boundaries. And why not? I mean, it helps to learn these rules and boundaries later. But then I felt like as becoming a novelist and becoming an artist, so much of my time has been spent about unlearning the rules, unlearning the conventions, to try to reach that kind of creativity. So, you know, he, for example, really loves books called Diary of a Wimpy Kid and Dog Man. And uh, with, I'll give you, for, Dog Man, for, Dog Man, okay, dog, how many of you have heard of Dog Man? Okay, some of you, right? It's brilliant. It's about a, a, a cop and his dog who get blown up by an evil cat. And in order to survive, they're stitched back together, so it's the dog's a cat, the, the cop's body with a dog's head to make the greatest cop end ever, right? And then the books have titles like Fetch 22 and For Whom the Ball Rolls, so it's very literary. And I'm reading this and I'm like, wow, this is actually so good, what Daft Pilkey is able to do. And so what I learned from both you know, him but also Ellison's fascination with these stories is to ask why not? And so when I wrote my novel, The Committed, which, you know, nine-year-olds probably shouldn't read, nevertheless, the motivation was, why not? Every time I had a, a, an aesthetic decision to make, why not? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? And so I think it made me a better writer to be in touch with some of that inner child inside of me and the outer child that's always there for Allison. Thank you so much, Viet. Okay, so um, now I think we're going to have, uh, we have time for Viet to uh, do a reading. Um, and then we'll take questions from the audience after that. Okay, so as I said, this is the most difficult book I've ever written, the most terrifying book I've ever written. And for you, it's going to be especially terrifying because I'm going to sing. It's going to be very bad. It's only going to be one line, all right? Um, and this is the opening chapter of this memoir, which still has no title. I've turned it into my editor and agent, and we're, all, we're debating the title and so on. But the title of the chapter is, Do You Know the Way to San Jose? Memory begins with Bama. Their images like photographs. Their story like a movie. All our parents should have movies made of their lives, or at least my parents should. Their epic journey deserves star treatment, even if only in an independent 
low-budget film. Beautiful Joan Chen in her prime would play my mother, the young heartthrob Russell Wong, my father. So what if neither actor is Vietnamese? We're all Asians here. Joan Chen did play a Vietnamese mother in the big budget Heaven and Earth, Oliver Stone's biopic about Lily Hayslip, a Vietnamese peasant girl caught in the whirlwind of a terrible war. Sexy Russell with his chiseled cheeks and pouty lips could have been a movie star if Hollywood cast Asian American men as romantic leads. His slicked back hair reminds me of my father in a black and white headshot from the 1950s, his hair a gleam. I, whose unending obsession with the styling and maintenance of my hair begins at 16, should have asked Ba when he could still remember what hair product he used. I could try and fix my own hair in that way, the way I tried on my mother's gray sweatshirt after she died and discovered that I could fit inside its empty space. In this movie flickering in my mind's musty theater, Wong Kar Wai directs in his typically moody, seductive way. The lighting, dim. The mood, romantic. The color scheme, faded Polaroid. And the actor who plays me, a cute little boy with big black eyes. After the movie comes and goes, he's never heard from again. No one remembers his name. Perhaps Wong Kar Wai could cast his cinematic spell on our house by the freeway in San, Jose, in San Jose. Our street didn't even possess a name like the Mango Street of San Jose Cisneros. Just a number and a direction. South, 10th, black iron bars on the windows. The house is stained a dark brown, perhaps meant to evoke tree bark, built from wood and shingle, stucco and silence, memory and forgetting. For most refugees and immigrants, life is rented rooms or rented homes, overcrowded apartments or overstuffed houses, extended families and necessary tenants. Cluttered rooms, bare lives, Damien Ng says in her novel, Bone. Her setting is an unexotic Chinatown, but at least it's in San Francisco. Who's ever written about provincial San Jose an hour's drive away or shine the light of cinema on it? At least Dionne Warwick celebrated the city with a song. Do you know the way to San Jose? <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Yes, it was awesome. Of, of course, it's not as good as the songs about San Francisco. Dionne Warwick herself admitted it. It's a dumb song and I didn't want to sing it. Still, her song won a Grammy, sold millions, was a global top 10 hit in 1968. While people song, sang along to their home hi-fis or in the comfort of a wood paneled station wagon, American soldiers commanded by a Mexican American captain murdered 504 Vietnamese civilians in Mi Lai three years before my birth. A decade after Dionne Warwick's song climbs the charts, we arrive in San Jose from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where we had lived for the first three years in the United States. Our house on South 10th was another step towards the blinking red neon sign of the American dream beckoning us forward across the dark plains of this republic. My parents crossed those plains by jet after hearing about San Jose, California, warmer weather, better opportunities, many more of our countrymen. So, in 1978, we moved. Thank God. Just kidding, Harrisburg. I don't even believe in God. And so what if San Jose had a song and you don't, Harrisburg? No one needs directions to San Francisco. Those who find their way to San Jose might dri may drive through East Santa Clara Street, the digestive tract running through the city's pot belly of a downtown. It is on this street that Ba Ma opened the city's second Vietnamese grocery store, the belly button of the city's pot belly. My parents call it the Saigon Mai. White rice and 50 pound sacks are stacked to the rafters. In the back, a butcher hacks at fish and meat while stamp prices in purple ink on cans of grass jelly and lychees and syrup. Coco Rico coconut soda in green cans a machine for grinding coffee whose aroma mixes with the rice. JVC stereos with cassette players in boxes behind the counter, which my parents send home to our relatives who sell them for cash. Why do they need cash? 
And why can we not send cash if they need it? My life with Bama, defined by questions I never ask. Under the glass counter are Chinese martial arts paperback novels translated into Vietnamese, which my brother can read, but I can't and never will. I'm eight. I can and do eat all the Chinese donuts and fried sesame balls I want, as well as Danish butter cookies and blue tins and sugary ladyfingers and chocolate-covered cherries that pop and ooze in my mouth. I have everything I need, but almost nothing I want. I don't want Catholicism, but my parents enroll me in St. Patrick's School a few blocks south, a Vietnamese boy wearing Irish green corduroys and an Irish green cardigan with a shamrock on its pocket. I turn out an atheist. Don't tell my father, whose Catholic name is Joseph, same as mine. My mother's Maria. Like many other immigrants and refugees before them, Bama become human sacrifices, throwing themselves onto barbed wire so I can walk, so I can walk across their backs. They work relentlessly almost every waking hour, almost every day of the year except for Easter, Det, and Christmas. One way I know now that they love my brother and me is that they only occasionally make us work at the Saigon Mai. This is why one Christmas Eve in the late 1970s, when I'm still eight, my parents are at the Saigon Mai while my, brother, my older brother and I stay home. I am watching television. I am waiting for Bama to come home when they will prepare dinner for their waiting children. In later years, my father describes my otherwise dutiful brother as a picky eater, in contrast to me, who eats everything my parents make. Perhaps being a picky eater is my otherwise responsible elder brother's way of resisting his obligations. Perhaps I intuit that to prepare a meal is to show love without saying, I love you. The meal they might have made that Christmas Eve would have had three courses, as always, a vegetable side like stir-fried rau muung or sliced cucumbers in a vinaigrette. A simple soup, most likely kan kajua, the tomatoes blistered by the hot broth, flavored by a handful of tiny dried shrimp. And a meat dish, oftentimes the boiled liver, tongue, intestine, or tripe of cows. Or the boiled gizzards, livers, and hearts of chickens, served with a weak dipping sauce of nuk mam, diluted by water, or salt and pepper floating in a pool of lemon juice. I chew and chew without protest because I love my parents and know no other way to repay them than to eat what they cook and to attempt to be what they say I must be at nearly every meal. Good, obedient, respectful. I interpret these commands to mean do as I am told, be quiet, ask no questions. Perhaps because it's Christmas Eve, Bama will bring home a bottle of $3.99 cook's champagne from the lucky supermarket that gives me a headache and makes me think for decades that I do not like champagne. But instead of the pop of champagne, the phone rings in the kitchen and my brother leaves me where I am, watching cartoons in the living room. I'm laughing when my brother reappears. Bama have been shot, my brother says. Bama have been shot, he says again. What's the matter with you? I stop laughing. Why don't you say anything? Don't you feel anything? Is numbness a feeling? Your brother, seven years older, is crying. You keep your gaze fixed on the television, saying nothing, which you will excel at. You have no memory of how you sleep that night or of how or when Bama returned from the hospital the next day, but you know they soon go back to work. Mere flesh wounds cannot stop them, or so you think at the time. Bama are inevitable. Bama are immortal. Easier to think of them in this way, or not to think of them at all, than to imagine them lying on their queen-sized bed on their return home, nursing wounds, maybe even weeping, terrified of the next day and night at the Saigon Mai. Your family never speaks of this incident, just as you will never speak of so many things. Just as you never cry for the stigmata you do not ask to see and Bama do not show, wounds awash in the red neon light of the movie of their lives that no one will make. Too bad you become a writer instead of a filmmaker. Now 
you live in Los Angeles. When you tell people you're a writer, no one cares. Thank you. Okay, so we are now opening to questions from the audience, and I think there should be a couple people roaming around with microphones. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, you said your parents come from a rural northern village. How far north, where, whereabouts, and how did they get out of Vietnam? Uh, well, okay, I mean, officially it was southern Vietnam, the southern half of Vietnam, because the country had been divided, but it was on the very northern end of it. And it's uh, in a, uh, about 30 minutes from a city called Vinh in a province called Hat Dinh, I think that's how you pronounce it, which is 30 minutes from where Ho Chi Minh was born, Ho Chi Minh. And so that region uh, is famous for producing hardcore communists and hardcore Catholics, who I think are basically related. You know, in my thinking, Hardcore communists and hardcore Catholics are basically mirror images of each other. They basically believe in the same formula of, for example, suffering, sacrifice, martyrdom, revolution, utopia, all that kind of thing. They just imagine the, the content differently. So that's where, that's where they were raised. Up in a conservative Vietnamese household and experiencing an ideological shift when you came to Berkeley and began taking Asian American studies classes, how did that shape and change your relationship with your parents? Well, you know, I'd always been used to living a secret life with my parents. I don't think this is that unusual. Um, maybe it is. I don't know. But I, I, it seems to me that a lot of us who are refugees and immigrants, and maybe others, you know, we, we, we grow up having to negotiate between parental expectations, community expectations, and our own desires. Now, if those things merge, that's awesome. I don't know too many people like that. Usually there's some kind of divergence to some degree or in another. And in my case, again, the way I coped with it is to be the man of two faces and two minds. I, was, I, I grew up with an experience of duality. Basically, I was a liar, okay? Um, but hey, maybe my parents lied to me too. I have no idea. I felt like, you know, we, I grew up with this sense that my parents were sacrificing all these things for me. How do I reconcile that? And they had all these expectations of me. How do I reconcile that with my own you know, need to be an individual without harming my parents? So I said, okay, well, if I lie to them and present a different face to them, that's for their own good. If they're happy and they don't know what's going on, then there shouldn't be a problem, should there? So I don't think my parents ever knew, for example, about my own political inclinations, uh, my intellectual transformations, or the fact that I got arrested. I never, never talked about any of that kind of stuff. Um, and so the duality, I felt, was just my way of coping uh, with the, re the racial and political realities of the United States, but also with the, the real realities of this, of this household. And I felt that, yes, it was an act of deception, but it was also an act of protection, protecting myself, but also protecting my parents as well. Because, for example, do they really need to know I'm an atheist? What benefit is there for them, these very devout Catholics, to know that their son has rejected the God who is very important to them? So that's not a battle I thought was important to fight. Right? So I would go home, I would go to church, I would go through all the rituals and everything, and outside of that, I would never go to church. You know? uh, my son, when he was born, my, my, my father, uh, my parents demanded that he be, he, be, he be baptized. I baptized him. Great. You know, but he, I never take him to church. So everybody's happy, right? And that, to me, was the most important thing, was how do, I, how do we make everybody happy in this household, um, given all the sacrifices that have, that have gone around? And I just assumed that, you know, my parents were also possibly withholding things from me as well that I would never know about. And the definition of a secret, really, is that no one knows about it. If someone knows of a secret, by definition, it's not a secret, right? And so who knows what kinds of secrets were circulating in the household? Um, hi, um, big fan. I'm glad you're back after your ass talk a couple years ago. Um, I'm just curious. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you were talking we, about we you earlier. About you. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm a little nervous now. I'm even more nervous now. I, I um, believe the first time we met, you called me like like a really old guy. You called you called me back. Is that right? And then you corrected me and told me to call you Chu. Yeah. So yeah. I for those of you who know Vietnamese or any kind of honorific system, you know, it's kind of rude to call people by a term that is not appropriate. So I've I'm now reached the age where some young people will call me the equivalent of what they call their grandparents. I'm like, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> call me by uncle. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I'm. I'm curious. I'm like actually working on a um, on an independent project right now, researching like Vietnamese American political history, and I'm like growing an appreciation for how much, like just, I guess just how much information you packed into the sympathizer and the committed, like just how much is going on in the background, um, and like all these different like political and historical events that occurred within the Vietnamese American diaspora. So I'm just curious what sort of research process you must have under like you must have undergone while writing and like I guess like what sort of processes you underwent while writing historical fiction because there's just so much you have to pack into that. Yeah so I mean the, the sympathizer for example almost everything that happens in that novel is based on real life um, and so for example and the characters too so if you know anything but I'll just give you a little anecdote you know like for example, the, the general in that novel is loosely based on, on, on many different, on, on several different generals, but mostly a guy named Nguyen Cao Kỳ, who was like Vietnam's uh, vice prime minister or something like that, you know, and a very flamboyant figure. The irony of it is that Nguyen Cao Kỳ produced a woman named uh, uh, Nguyen Cao Kỳ Zuyên, who is famous in the Vietnamese American community for being the host of a show called Paris by Night. Lo and behold, Nguyen Cao Zuyên has been cast as the general's wife in the TV series. You know, you want to talk about, for example, you know, history colliding with each other. But um, I grew up with this kind of history. So I knew a lot of the stuff that takes place in the novel. So, you know, the novel, for example, pivots upon an attempt by the South Vietnamese refugees to take their homeland back. I grew up, you know, watching that unfold uh, in the Vietnamese refugee community. And so writing the novel was just an opportunity to put a lot of the things that a lot of us as Vietnamese refugees know from either from fact or from rumor, which is as good as fact as far as I'm concerned, and putting it into the novel. And then the research really came about from filling out the novelistic details. So like if I, I, you know, writing about the fall of Saigon, I read everything there was about the fall of Saigon. I was there, but I was four years old. I don't remember anything. So I had to you know, do all this research to recreate that in the first 50 pages. Or I had to research the secret police, or I had to research torture techniques, all the fun stuff, you know? And in The Committed, um, that was a very different experience because there I'm writing about France, which is not my territory, and that's mostly a fictional plot. And so the research was a little bit different there uh, in the sense that I had to make up a, a plot for the novel. But the research was, you know, like in, you know, actually visiting France. This is really hard research. Going to Paris for a few summers, hanging out there, talking to as many French people of Vietnamese descent as I could, and uh, trying to absorb as much of the French language and culture and so on to make it seem authentic. And I'm actually very flattered by the fact that a lot of French people, French readers have said, this is actually a really good recreation of early 1980s Paris. And so I, th I feel like I did, uh, I did my homework. So there's always, it's always a tricky question when you're a writer uh, and when, it, when, it comes to, when it comes to research because I think uh, it's, e it's possibly easy to do so much research that you never get around to the writing of the book. And so with the sympathizer, it was always, and with the committed, it was always do enough research to get started with the writing. And then when, when I get to some part of the story where I know I need to do more research, I'll do that then. And so I would just space things out. I would pace things out as a way of, of making sure that I was also writing at the same time. Hi, um, your writing really speaks to these ideas of refugee temporality and this idea of uh, resettlement as a false pr proposition. And so I was wondering how do we as students, writers, and Vietnamese Americans mobilize these memories of the past and imagine this new speculative liberatory future? Well, I think that if you're um, a refugee, uh, and also an immigrant, but maybe especially a refugee, maybe there's a real desire, as you were saying, for settlement, you know, to find a home since you've lost your home, uh, or to find a home because you've moved homes. And this goes back to the notion of authenticity. I mean, authenticity and home, these are both wonderful things for obvious reasons, but they're also very potentially dangerous things because they tempt us to recreate these 
divisions between who's inside and who's outside. I mean, who's literally inside the house, who's outside of the house. So for example, there are actually Vietnamese refugees who have said, we are the good refugees. These new people coming from south of the border or brown people or Muslims, these are the bad refugees. And that's a very you know, bad impulse to, to undertake or to, to, to internalize. And when Vietnamese refugees say this, they're basically, they're not, they're not being particularly uh, evil, they're just doing what every other American generation before them has done. Going back to at least 1751, Benjamin Franklin, writing about Pennsylvania, my home state, said, Pennsylvania, keep Pennsylvania white. I'm paraphrasing, that's basically what he's saying. Keep Pennsylvania white. Keep out those swarthy aliens. Do you know who he was talking about? The Germans. For him, the Germans were the dark-skinned aliens. And so that pattern has been with us for a very long time, not unique to the United States, and refugees are tempted into that. And partly one of the reasons why refugees are tempted into that is because for many refugees, they're coming from places where they were the ones in charge. So I thought a lot more about the fact that when I became an Asian American, I thought of myself as a minority. Like here in the United States, I'm a minority, I'm Vietnamese, I'm Asian, and so on. But in Vietnam, I was a part of the majority. And, you know, when I think about Vietnam, I think about the fact that if, if, if nothing had changed and, and we had stayed there and we had had all our wealth and stuff, I would be the equivalent of a white person in Vietnam because there's like 52, 53 ethnic minorities, so-called ethnic minorities in Vietnam. So it's, maybe it's not a surprise that a lot of Vietnamese refugees have come to the United States. They certainly feel themselves to be refugees, but what they desire to recreate is not refugee temporality, what you're talking about, but the temporality of a nation where they were the privileged ones. I think this helps to account for why there's so much conservatism and reactionary politics in the Vietnamese community, but also in a lot of other refugee and immigrant communities too. So the, 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 the difficult thing here is refugee temporality, what you're describing, is this kind of existence that most people would not want to choose for themselves because who wants to live in a refugee camp? No one, I don't think. But I still call myself a refugee even though I'm clearly bourgeoisie because I want to keep standing alongside other refugees. But I also want to keep alive this idea that part of what's crucial about the refugee temporality, refugee experience, is a skepticism about the nation state, a skepticism about home, a skepticism about belonging, because we know what it's like to be cast out. And the response to that should not be, let us in and keep everybody else out. The response should be, let's try to figure out this other time that you're talking about, the more utopian time of what it would be like to have a, a world where nation state borders wouldn't matter and don't exist. That's what the experience of refugees uh, prophesies. But for now, the experience of refugees serve as a deterrent versus a, a, a sign of what we should be embracing. Okay. I think we can take one more question. You mentioned almost in passing that you had a sister that was left behind. Is there a story that you can share about that and did that impact your relationship with your parents or your sense of security when you arrived in this America as a refugee? Yeah, so I mean, it, it goes back to that very first photograph of my, my mother and I at two, when I was like two or three years of age. Um, likewise, when we fled uh, by Mitoit, I was four so when I look at my own children, when they're three and four years old, they're interactive, they're human beings, they have feelings, emotions, and everything. And I think about me at that time, and when we fled, I must have been scared, I must have recognized that we were leaving my adopted sister behind and so on, but I have no memory of that, but she does. And likewise, I look at my children, I will have, again, I have memories that they won't have of things that obviously bring them pleasure or bring them pain and so on. So yes, when I be you know, I was aware of the fact that I had an adopted sister and that she was somebody we never talked about in the household. And then when I was about uh, 10 or 11 years old, she sent us a photograph. And that was, that was when I really started to become conscious of her because now I had a picture to which I could attach this idea of an adopted sister. And so uh, I think it had, really, it had a really Im a strong impact on me because I, I felt like uh, our house was haunted through this photograph of this 16-year-old girl at the time who was by then, when she sent the photograph in her 20s, 
here was this person who was a part of a family who's not a part, and yet who's not here. In more academic language, we would call this an absent presence, another kind of ghost in the household. And in every Vietnamese refugee household I visited, I felt that. There would always be these black and white photographs of the people who'd been left behind. And you would be a lucky family if you didn't have those pictures, if you didn't have those people left behind. So that was a story, you know, I felt, again, I feel like obviously there's a lot of individual pain and emotion there for my family because of this and for obviously for my adopted sister, but there was also a, a, a universal experience or near universal experience for the Vietnamese refugees. And so I think for a lot of us, we didn't talk about these kinds of things, not because they didn't matter, but because everybody had been through them. And people who have not been refugees hear these kinds of stories and people are like, wow, this is, this is amazing or terrifying or whatever that this happened, and it is, but this was normal for the refugee community. So I think we've all tried to deal with our, 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 the pain and the absence and the trauma in our own ways, some more effectively than others. And in my case, <laughs> there's a line in the, in, in, the, in the memoir, the only way I know how to grieve is through writing. That's why I wrote the book. It's my way of grieving my mother, my father, my adopted sister, the life that could have been. Um, and if the book is mostly about my, my mother as an other, it's also about my adopted sister as an other as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>